the course. Um, these notes are on the course website. Uh, before we get started though, please uh, fill in a course evaluation for this course um, if, you, if you haven't done so already. I, I really do use these comments that you provide in that forum um, for improving the course every year. Comments about the assignments, the projects, the lectures, the guest lectures, the videos, um, extra resources posted, anything related to the course to help make um, it better for future years is appreciated. Uh, so we do take those very seriously. Um, the final exam is on Tuesday, the 9th of December. It's in the afternoon in Iverwin. There's 90 marks on the exam and it's uh, critical that you manage your time properly. So three hours, 180 minutes, 90 marks, you shouldn't be spending more than two minutes per mark on any question. And that's, that's an overestimate. You should be spending a little bit less time per mark. Um, there's full coverage of all topics in the course, in the exam. And please um, don't just see the sections as individual sections. There, do, there is integration, so there's some combination of parts of the course. So there's not a question on drying. There's not just a question on centrifuges, on just cyclones. These topics integrate in, in a logical way. And so you can combine these topics to solve the problem. The uh, top of the exam looks as follows. So guaranteed two things you know will be in the exam. One is a psychrometric chart, and the second is this will be at the top of your exam. Um, this, you may bring in any materials, any textbooks, any papers. I'm not too concerned what you bring in in printed form. Um, you may use any calculator that you wish, no matter how much you program it. Um, you may answer the questions in any order in the booklet as, as you choose. Uh, don't repeat back the question. This is, I, I grade hundreds of papers and I, it never amazes me that people rewrite the question back to me in some form. I don't understand the need for that. Um, please don't do that. Uh, the other suggestion is to please use a strategy to solve a problem that when you're stuck and can't see an obvious way through it, please resort and try to use a problem solving strategy that I've used countless of times now in the course. So we've, we're very comfortable with that approach. You can blame the Ontario education system for that. In like elementary school, they always tell us to like start off by rewriting the question so you have a way to transition okay. in. Okay. <laughs> well, you've got three hours. I really do not need to see it repeated back to me. If you feel you have the time to repeat it back, that's quite okay. I just skip over it anyway. Um, yeah. So. This is important here in bold. If anything is unclear or information appears to be incomplete, make a reasonable assumption and continue with the question. If you pull me over in the exam to ask a question, I will simply point to that on your script. That's my standard approach. Um, I can't answer any other questions in the exam. In fact, there's a high probability I may not be at the exam because I've been called for jury duty the day prior and typically, jury duty, if you are selected, you will go right into a court case. And so I may not be there, in fact. Um, if I am not selected, I will be there. But um, if you do ask me for a question, that is what I will refer you to nine times out of ten, unless it is a legitimate question that I can answer. It's related to a mistake or something. Okay. Uh, this is also important. It's not on the script, but please bear in mind that multiple TAs and myself grade these exams. So do not use red because we then can't tell whether it's a TA or uh, myself making those changes. Um, okay, so what's in the exam? Everything that was covered during class time, guest lectures, videos that I show in class, these interactive tutorial style questions, problem and answer questions we have frequently, short quizzes that we've had in the past. Um, all of that is examinable. Any questions about that? No. Um, next, uh, you, you've seen this before, you may bring anything. I, I wouldn't mind if you had iPads, laptops, tablets, but the university has a policy against that, so that is not allowed. Um, the way to look at perhaps studying, this is a suggestion, you're obviously very capable uh, given the fact that you're this far along in your university education. But perhaps let me suggest that you go back to your midterms and try to repeat problems that you didn't do well in. 
repeat assignment questions that you didn't get um, really correct. But importantly, just go understand why you didn't get it right the first time. Uh, what did you misunderstand? What concepts do you need to review? There are two textbooks recommended for this course, not required, but the Giancopolis textbook you likely have. They've got questions there on topics related to centrifuges, filtration, and membranes. So feel free to use the, back, uh, the questions in the back of those chapters. The CEDA textbook, um, which you may not have, um, has questions related to membranes, liquid-liquid extraction, adsorption, and drying. So there's coverage of all topics across multiple textbooks. Now, these are not the only two books. Every section of the course website, I give you four or five references related to that topic. So if there is a topic that you don't quite understand, um, please refer to either these books or some of those others. I've also posted multiple practice questions, including all the prior final exams that I've given for this course. So there's ample ability there to practice. Um, I, I do a, a bit of educational research, and uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, a lot of this research shows how to go about studying. Um, I know I've done this before. I read a topic and I say, yeah, I could do that. Um, that seems no problem. But when you actually try to do it later on, it's, it's quite different. So don't just read or glance at something and believe that you could do it. Actually spend some time doing it. A good way to test yourself is can you explain this to your study partner? A topic that you've learned, don't just close the book and just re-explain it. Can you explain it two, three hours later to someone else? Um, can you explain the, pl the plan or the approach you would have taken to solve a particular problem to a fellow engineer? We don't um, do this frequently, but in practice you would. You're in a meeting and someone says, well, how would you know what the drying time is? And you would have to be able to explain the approach you would take to one of your colleagues. Um, this is interesting, and again, feel free to ignore it, but there is a ample scientific evidence to show that these distractions um, are not helpful. Um, if you're reading a text, you've got your phone in one hand and the TV on in the background, that's not helpful. Another one that's interesting that's not in this paper but in, in several other papers is that studying with a highlighter is absolutely useless. Right? Highlighting your notes does absolutely nothing for your understanding. So please throw your highlighters away. Um, they do not do much for you at all. There's, there's really good solid evidence for that. Um, it's, it's lulling you into the feeling that you're, you're learning something and you might as well just use your finger to follow along in the text. Does the equivalent amount. Um, okay, so let's just step back to the beginning of this course. We, we started off this course by saying this topic is important because separations are so widely applied. Um, in many cases, 90% of a flow sheet can be based just on separation units that follow each other. And we've seen that the separation factor, we've seen that a number of times, the cost of a unit will be in proportion to the separation factor. So you have to put in more operating costs to get a higher separation factor. That's, um, again, just a fact of life. It comes from thermodynamics. We can't get that high level of purity for nothing. So, and, and we saw this earlier on, um, you're, you're familiar with all of these now, that these separators exist simply around us in our regular lives, but also in, um, in our processing plants. The other reason why we looked at separations is this idea that our population is growing around us. Even with the worst case estimates shown here in green, you will see some growth in the population at least during the period of your career, 2050, which is, might be when you retire. So at that point, population will still be growing at the very worst case estimates. And people need food, they need energy, they need water, and they need access to health care. And all four of those are strongly reliant on separation units. So there's guaranteed careers and career growth related to just this driving force in, um, in our world around us. Okay, if we look back at our course and how we studied it, it was fairly carefully structured. We started over here on the top right, looking at mechanical forces being applied. Uh, whether they were for free from sedimentation or whether we had to add the force, as in a centrifuge or a cyclone, we, had to, we used this force balance, the idea of Stokes' law, to 
describe the separation step. Now I switched cyclones and filters around this year. Um, filters I normally, they could go in either side, but filters are a good transition to our next section of membranes. Membranes are nothing more than a type of filter. Um, and then when we looked at membranes, we looked at several types, microfiltration, ultrafiltration, and reverse osmosis. So that was about our first half of the semester. And then we moved to mass-based, uh, mass transfer-based separation. So liquid-liquid extraction was one. Um, these ones in square brackets are topics that are related. The same concepts apply, but we don't study them. So if you come across crystallization, the topics from these other areas work as well. Leaching is, in fact, another one that goes over here that I've omitted. Um, then we looked at column-based separations of bed, uh, like packed bed. So adsorption, ion exchange, chromatography, these all take place along some sort of bed or column. And then lastly, we looked at heat transfer and mass transfer-based separations, so evaporation, drying, um, crystallization and distillation. We didn't get a chance to look at evaporation. Um, that should be further down here. So all of these were connected and the one material, each material flows in some way logically into the other. There's a good connection there, which is why they're sequenced in that way. Now, if you don't remember what was covered when, uh, obviously if you go to every section on the course website, I work with week numbers. We are currently in week 14, for example. You could go back to week 11, where we were looking at adsorption in week 11 and 12. And um, here in this column, I give some idea of what the lecture was about. And there's the corresponding video, if you wish to recap it. Um, here, again, you can use this, uh, this PDF that I'll post, or is posted on the course website, as another way to look up topics. Um, if you're trying to find the corresponding uh, material, we started off with sedimentation, then particle size distributions, and each one of these letters represents a lecture. So we spent about six weeks on those topics. I don't think I need to recap all of this. Um, I, these slides are just basically a, a, a mind map or of the essential equations. In the sedimentation, we've seen it too many times, this equation of Stokes's law to calculate the settling velocity provided Reynolds number is less than one. If um, we don't have that Reynolds number less than one, the generic equation is the one with the square root. For that, we need the um, drag force, CD, which we can look up or calculate. Um, with particle size distribution, the idea of equivalent diameters we've seen before, the idea of uh, grids or meshes, I should say, um, that characterize our particles. Characterize is just a fancy way of saying describe. So how do we describe our, our solids? We can either look at them from a cumulative analysis, percent passing, cumulative percent passing, or if you take the derivative of that curve, you end up with um, the curve that's kind of shown behind the text over here. Um, it looks sort of like a bell-shaped, often if it's um, normally distributed. But the idea is that we can look at a differential analysis or a cumulative analysis. They're just giving different views on the same, the same distribution. Then the next topic we looked at was centrifuges. Centrifuges use that idea of uh, settling velocity. Um, it appears over there in that larger bracket, the terminal settling velocity. And then we multiply it by sigma to get our flow rate through the centrifuge, our Q, our cut flow rate. So what this um, equation does is we can take this equation for Q cut, and we can ratio it. And if we ratio it, notice I've dropped out VTSV. Well, the reason why we can drop VTSV out is if we're settling the same solids, so the terminal settling velocity doesn't change. It's, it's a function of the solid and the fluid that it's in. But what I can go do is take that, so that fluid and run it in a different centrifuge, A versus B. So centrifuge A, centrifuge B, and then I can specify Q cut A and calculate Q cut B. So specify three out of the four variables in that equation if you're transferring from one centrifuge to another centrifuge. That would be one way uh, to use that equation. So we, we saw that um, in an assignment question as well. Filtration was our next topic. We looked at, again, lab-based filtrations 
are then used to scale up to a larger scale. So in the lab, we can then calculate this coefficient B, the medium's resistance. If we look at that term there, RM is the medium's resistance, and the term KP is the resistance due to the cake. In a lab-based filtration device, we can get those two constants, B and K, KP, and we can then go use this for a larger scale unit. Now, in the larger scale unit, you'll obviously have a different area, so you'll just have to modify these coefficients B and KP for the different area. And as we showed as well in the filtration topic, that B, this term, this first term in that filtration equation is obviously much, much smaller than the second term, least of which is because of the, the square root, but mostly because B is numerically smaller than KP. So if we were adding up these two times, B is, is often in the order of magnitude of seconds, and the second term is in the order of minutes or hours, and so we can disregard that first term um, as, a, as a reasonable assumption. Okay, so that was uh, the topic of filtration, and then we moved on to cyclones. Cyclones um, are really difficult to understand from the first principle. Uh, we don't know what's going on in a cyclone and can't model it very carefully, um, but what we can do is we can find a grade efficiency curve for a cyclone, which tells us that if we um, what particle sizes we will expect reporting out in the coarse stream given the feed. Remember g of x is the ratio of the coarse stream leaving in the underflow divided by what we feed in. So <laughs> that tells us what particles we can recover g of x for a given size. And we had a question in the midterm where we, we put successive cyclones in series and we looked at a discussion in class with a bit of um, dilution effects and feedback essentially if you're feeding back the outlet gas and diluting your feed again with a bit of a recycle. So we've covered some of those G of X curves then in the cyclone topic. After that we moved to membranes and we co focused on three membranes. So here class 6, 7, 8 and 9, sorry weeks 6, 7, 8 and 9 we focused on membranes. Three types were considered, microfiltration, ultrafiltration and RO, reverse osmosis. And um, coming, this was probably the first time in the course where we introduced flux as an important concept of driving force over resistance. And in each one of these three membranes, all that changes is either our driving force, so pressure is our driving force in um, these first two equations, and our resistance changes. Our resistance changes either the medium resistance is important or the cake resistance is important. So for microfiltration, the medium is important. For ultrafiltration, we build up this, this layer on the surface of the membrane that uh, provides some resistance. And in RO, what happens is we, we have an additional resistance that, um, that, meet, that we face by delta pi. So our, our osmotic pressure itself presents a resistance and reduces our driving force. So even though you apply a certain delta P, that's reduced by the corresponding osmotic pressure differences. So that, um, that was essentially a single equation that summarizes all of membranes um, is this first flux equation over there with the appropriate modifications. So, so we, we, we covered a number of examples on that topic and all of them just refocus on that single equation in a different way. Weeks 9, 10, and 11 was a, a change in, in our thinking. We looked at bringing back this diagram that you've seen from physical chemistry. We looked at all these new concepts. Um, I don't think we need to recap any of this here in this class. It's all um, recap of, of stuff you've seen before. What was new and interesting perhaps was using this for countercurrent and for cross current flow. And so this most recent assignment you did a comparison between cross and countercurrent um, and evaluated those two. Our second last topic was adsorption. Um, we were looking at several isotherms. The isotherm simply is a statement of equilibrium, um, and there's at least Langmuir and Freundlich, as well as linear isotherms, could be used. And they tell us how our fluid concentration is related to the adsorbed <laughs> concentration. And from that, we, we used those isotherms and we designed lengths 
of the bed required to achieve a given adsorption. And adsorption is typically batch based. Uh, we load material onto the adsorbent, stop, and regenerate. So those were um, some of the important concepts from adsorption. And then the, finally, the drying topic, we've just considered now um, heat transfer, mass transfer being related over there, as well as um, psychrometric charts. So that's just a broad overview of the topics. Um, I'll leave the, that idea of the common themes in there. Um, this is, I've mentioned this too many times in the course, how, we, how you should focus on looking at these optimization units. Um, so finally, I just have one piece of advice for you. Please treat the exam like a closed book exam. There is not time to be flipping around through all your notes and using your exam as a study period. Uh, that will, will lead to um, failure and lead to problems. Please use your time wisely and pre-study. Pre and then lastly, I do want to thank the TAs. They're not here today, um, but they've done a significant job behind the scenes. And then also just to thank you for your questions and comments that have uh, been sent by email or in class. Um, I've, I've used that to improve the course in, in some ways this year, and I'm looking forward to hearing your other feedback in the evaluations to keep improving it. So thank you, and good luck with the exam.